let me first introduce um, our guest tonight, uh, Professor um, Anne uh, uh, Francoise Espinois, uh, consultant of pediatric urology and robotic surgery in Ghent uh, University, Belgium. They have a uh, huge experience in the management of avoiding dysfunction uh, in children, and they have a unique experience of having uh, avoiding school for uh, children with refractory avoiding dysfunction. Um, I I'm welcoming her, and I thank her very much uh, for her time and for participating with us with, with her huge uh, experience in that field. So uh, please, Dr. Anne, uh, you are welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure to, to be a guest in your uh, uh, Egyptian Pediatric Urology Club. And um, thank you indeed for uh, let me talk about avoiding this function. Um, Ghent University Hospital has, tr tr by tradition, the last 30 years, developed indeed a lot of experience with Piet Hubeke and Johan van der Waal. Those are the main investigators about this, and they have developed a large experience about functional urology, dysfunctional avoiding, and enuresis. And it will be my pleasure tonight uh, to try to, to put some basics again and to go on further on what is actually avoiding dysfunction and what is avoiding school which is something really easy to implement but is working really well in all those children with daily incontinence. So I will start first with a few basics uh, just to make sure that we all say, talk about the same things. Uh, I will talk about what's exactly the problem, the continence problem, and then now, once I've started about continence, I will go on further on defining what is uh, avoiding this function, and then I will show you what we do in our experience in avoiding school. So let's start with a small background and on the basics of incontinence to make sure and to we all understand the the same things. So um, if I got it well, we are coming from different backgrounds. Um, in my experience in Europe and in Egypt and uh, a little bit all over the world, people are coming from pediatric surgery or from urology and doing pediatric urology. As we have different backgrounds, we don't have the same lecture always on functional urology, and that's why I will focus on. So as you all know, of course, continence, the acquisition of continence is really an important milestone for a child. And the child is supposed to acquire the daytime bladder control around the, the time of three, four years of age. While the child is allowed to wait a little bit longer for the nighttime bladder control, and the, the child is supposed to be dry at night, uh, at, at, the, at the, the latest at six years old. So, what is it? Why is it so important? What is pediatric incontinence? Well, when we were born, we were we all have an uncontrolled bladder, and we have an uncontrolled nighttime diuresis. And we move on with maturation uh, from incontinent at birth to a controlled bladder and a controlled nighttime diuresis with growing up. So there's there a processes of bladder sphincter unit that has to, to maturate. We have to also let grow the nervous system and the, the maturation of the diuresis. The requirements to have normal maturations are multiple and we can divide them into two main, two main sections, the anatomical one and the functional ones. So let's go through those requirements to be able to acquire continence. The child has to have a normal lower urinary tract, that's anatomical. The child has to have a normal innervation of the lower urinary tract, that's also anatomical, and has to be able to have a normal cognitive function, has to have water and solid handling, and then we go on the, for the functional part, having a normal toilet training. So while a lot of us will f mainly focus on the anatomical part, let's not underestimate the functional part because Bailey, basically when you have a child with day, day incontinence uh, or nightly incontinence, you can have 
uh, of course, the anatomical anomalies that we will need to treat by surgery. All of us know that and like to do that. But then there's also all the other reasons that might sometimes be overlooked because we don't always think about it. And those are the functional reason, reasons. And those are called the pediatric lower urinary tract disorders. And that's what, we're, what we are going to focus about today, the functional disorders and especially the dysfunctional voiding. So what, let's go a little bit about definitions. The definitions in a child who might have daily incontinence, the daily incontinence might be caused by an overactive bladder. It will be characterized by urgency. Um, you might have a child with urge incontinence and then you will have a combination of incontinence and urgency. Next to that, you have the concept of voiding postponement. It's a child who typically will try to wait as long as possible before going to void and will typically hold the, vo the holding maneuvers, will sit on, uh, hold his penis, will sit on his ass. You might also have an underactive bladder. Then typically we will have a child with a very low voiding frequency, a very low, um, uh, drink uh, intake. You will have a child who have use of a raised intravenous pressure to void. That's all different concepts. The concept which is interesting us today and which might also be causing daily incontinence is actually dysfunctional voiding. And according to the definition of Paul Austin uh, by the ICCS definition, dysfunctional voiding is the contraction of the sphincter during voiding, producing Euroflow curves uh, of a staccato type. Let's look at that immediately. Um, this is the, the report from Paul Austin and the ICCS panel from 2016, where all those concepts I just talked about are defined to help us characterize daily incontinence or enuresis. It's a good paper. I, I highly recommend it. Um, and so what is exactly dysfunctional voiding? Here is a quick look again at the bladder and the sphincter. Okay, and when you have a normal voiding patter pattern, you will have contraction of the detrusor and relaxation of the sphincter. And this will produce a Euroflow like this with a bell-shaped curve, while on the EMG, while the sphincter is closed, you will have registration on the EMG, and the child is supposed to lose to be able to void to release the sphincter. So you have a loosening here on the EMG. On the opposite, when you have dysfunctional voiding, the child is not able to coordinate the normal function of the detrusor and of the sphincter. And in place of losing the sphincter and contracting the detrusor to void, you will have that pattern where you will see really a staccato design and you will see on the EMG, EMG a continuous hypertonic sphincter with no relaxation during the micturition, which produce all those spikes. This is the, the classical definition of what is dysfunctional voiding. And it's one of the classical pediatric lower urinary tract disorder. So what's important to know is that we will talk about dysfunctional voiding only in children who have non-neurogenic lower urinary tract disorders. Once you go into the category of spina bifida in those patients, myelomeningocele, you won't talk again about dysfunctional voiding because those children are not able to coordinate. Dysfunctional voiding is only on in healthy, normal children who just have due to many reasons, have been not been able to learn to use correctly their sphincter and to coordinate the sphincter and the bladder contraction. So, and you really see the typical staccato uh, pattern here compared to the normal bell-shaped and the EMG registration. This is really an important uh, concept that you will only talk about dysfunctional voiding in those normal children with no other anatomical or other problem uh, who have daily or nightly incontinence in the raises of the daily incontinence. So again, here are a comparison of the normal plateau shape curve and the staccato curve this, the, defined by the dysfunctional voiding. So now that we know exactly what is happening, just to show it again, normal bladder, the, the, the trusor, what is happening during the dysfunctional voiding, it's 
only in correct coordination between the smooth, non-striated muscle fibers of the bladder, bladder and the detrusor and the striated muscle fibers from the pelvic floor. So there is no anatomical problem here. It's only a functional problem. The kid, for some reason, hasn't learned to use normally what he has, which is normal. There is no surgery to do here. It's only a functional disorder. It's only something we have to learn the child to be able to do it. And the question is, okay, why those children who are, besides that, totally normal, did they develop this functional voiding? Well, you have here a few of the main reasons that will lead to dysfunctional voiding. The main ones are the child who typically will have too early toilet training. I will develop all those points, so I will just now tell it to you. Um, one of the other reasons of dysfunctional voiding might be UTIs, urinary tract infection. That's, that's temporary then. You might have also dysfunctional voiding caused by overactive bladder underactive bladder, and the most frequent one, at least in Europe, is by bladder bowel dysfunction. So let's look at all those causes one by one. So first of all, the too early toilet training. So that's something we really see a lot in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Denmark. And the reason is that uh, the child is not ready, not mature yet to have a toilet training. But due to the kindergarten pressure, due to the parents really pushing because they want the child to be ready to go to school, they want them to be, to be dry, uh, they start the, the training, and they start the group training eventually in the daycare. And basically, there is no individual approach. All those children are just put at regular hours on the potty. And it's not their own rhythm. And they don't really understand what they have to do. They don't understand the bladder sensation. And if you do the mistake that you put all the children on the same time on the potty, and if they produce some urine, they get a reward, you have reinforcement. They will learn to push, they will learn to strain, and they will produce some urine at any time, even if they don't have the sensation or the need to void. So don't never try to, to train the, to the child too early if the child is not ready for it. If the child is not interested, it won't work. So that's one of the first reasons we, we have, at least in Europe. And so um, those children, by developing the voiding phase through the straining, they will develop a perineal muscle tone that will be sky high. And they will learn to push. They have an inadequate putty. And usually also they have an insufficient fluid intake. All those reasons leading to a really, uh, really high pelvic muscle tone. And so that's typically the child, everybody looks at him, puts him on the, tra on the potty, and it's expected to, to produce some urine. That's something we really see in, 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 in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, and that's something really that we have to, to inform the parents about because it's easy to avoid. The next reason for eventually developing a high pelvic muscle tone and so dysfunctional voiding and so in rhesus or other, other problems of incontinence are urinary tract infection. The thing is that um, it's not only when you have that urinary tract infection, it might last after also, and especially in those children having recurrent urinary tract infection. And in this case, it's a voiding phase disorder and it's happening especially in those children having holding maneuvers and those children at school who have really short breaks between the lessons. They have no time to go to the toilet and there's a discrepancy between the toilet at home and at school. So what they do is just avoiding to go to the toilet. They avoid to go to the toilet so they don't want to drink too much and they just develop urinary tract infection on repetition. The, again, that's really something that's not to underestimate in all those young girls, four or five years old, 
with daily incontinence, you might see that they have recurrent uh, tract infection, bladder problems, and it's just because of those holding maneuvers in incorrect food intake. And so what happens is that develop, they develop post void residual urine, they develop pain, they develop frequency, and they might also have constipation. So it all leads at, with a vicious circle that they will have a high pelvic muscle tone and they might also develop a dysfunctional voiding just because they are waiting too long and they don't want to be at school and they develop urine tract infections. So that's again something really uh, easy to solve. And I will show you with the voiding school just after how we solve it. Um, the next reason, which is quite frequent also, is the all those children having overactive bladder. Um, this is again a storage phase disorder and those children, they have a bladder instability. So what happens, their bladder is nervous, they have urgency, urgency incontinence. And so what happens is that the pelvic floor at a reaction, has a reaction to this in, uh, incontinence and just is trying to hold it up. And so they hold up, they hold up as long as they can um, to, to counteract actually this bladder, which is overactive until they are unable to hold a relaxation just because they have developed again, a high pelvic muscle tone. And so usually you see in those children that they have an increasing bladder capacity and it's usually associated with especially the dysfunctional voiding and ORB are really, OEB are really frequent. So it's really a reaction from this bladder that as a reaction, the, the, the pelvic floor will try to hold up. And you see here this uh, typical Euroflow from a child having dysfunctional voiding based on overactive bladder. You see instability of the bladder and then he tries to hold up. And again, he, uh, bladder instability, so he has difficulties. He starts voiding again. He tries to hold up, that's a pelvic floor and so on and so on until the moment they, they just, cannot do otherwise and ping like that on overactivity. Um, on the opposite, you can have also children developing a high pelvic uh, muscle tone on underactive bladder. Um, it's again a voiding phase disorder and those children will develop a post void residual volume. They also have a large bladder capacity, but here it's partly due to postponement. They wait as long as possible. Um, they have here no bladder inst instability. That's really important. You will really see uh, on the Euroflow that they, they have a more difficult pattern. They have to strain. They have also, in contrary to the overactive bladder, a very low voiding frequency. And again, it will be accompanied by daytime incontinence. And here you will see the typical Euroflow of a child with dysfunctional voiding based on underactive bladder. You see that the child really has to strain to start micturition on each time because he cannot re relax his pelvic floor. So you see how long the micturition is and you see how difficult it is on the long run just to empty that bladder. And that's really uh, an important thing to, to see on the Euroflow. The last reason that you might develop a high uh, pelvic muscle tone dysfunctional voiding is b b bladder bowel dysfunction. So what is actually bladder bowel dysfunction? Well, bladder bowel dysfunction is a trouble where you, you think basically that bladder and bowel work along. And so those children, they also develop a high pelvic floor muscle tone because they have difficult relaxation of the external center of the rectum. And so by uh, association, they will have this difficult relaxation of the external um, urethral sphincter and they will have also intermittent voiding and micturition in multiple, multiple parts. It's caused by the constipation. The feces are present in the bowel, the pressure on the bladder. And so are really, as a consequence, you, they develop to, to be able to hold. Uh, they don't want to, 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 to go uh, for the feces. So the consequences are the daytime incontinence, the enuresis, and the UTI. And again, on the long run, they will really develop bladder bowel dysfunction. Uh, they will really develop, uh, sorry, dysfunctional voiding. 
Um, so this is how it works. By bowel dysfunction, you will have overactivity of the pelvic floor and dysfunctional uh, elimination of the urine. Bladder and bowel go really along together. It's been published already a long time ago and really nicely shown. I recommend you this paper, this nice paper. That's also, again, really easy to, to look for this problem if you know it, if you are aware of it. If you know that a child has bladder bubble dysfunction, um, if you look for it, you will find it. Just ask the child how his poo looks like. And you, you can have nice images that you can have in your outpatient clinic uh, showing how the feces should be looking like and how they, they should not be looking like. And this is the Bristol stools dart or chart. <laughs> Um, it's uh, really easy to have it in the consultation and if you see that the child uh, describes he's going to stool making feces one every two days, one every two days, three days, or that his stool, his feces look like bunny things or are really liquid, go look for bladder bowel dysfunction because just by just treating the constipation you will solve it and that's an easy way to solve also the, the, the bladder problem. So don't underestimate it. So now I've been to the main causes of um, dysfunctional voiding and of enoresis of daily incontinence. So how do we treat it? And that's easy because basically uh, it's much more easy than you might think. The first light treatments are uh, urotherapy and that's really according to the ICCS guideline what you should do first. Uh, then comes along further the pharmacotherapy, so the medications and Anyway, you can always have psychological support if it's available. But first light treatment in every recommendation is urotherapy. Medication comes for, come after. And so what's important is that urotherapy, it's something that is uh, non, no medication. It's non-surgical. It's basically educational and behavioral. So the urotherapy, what is it? It's basically just a bladder re-education re program. And so you will have to take time to educate the patient. It's cognitive and it's behavioral and physical. And that's why it's so important eventually to have help from a nurse or from somebody else, because we are surgeons, we are urologists and urotherapy takes time. So um, it's sometimes much easier to go directly to, to the medication. The only point is that and, uh, anticholinergics or whatever medication you might give will solve the problem thoroughly. while the urotherapy, if you educate the child and if you show the child how to avoid normally, you will help the, the child for the rest of his or her life. So this is really time consuming, but important. Don't underestimate it. And I will show you how we do it in Ghent. Um, we have basically a first light treatment where all the patient naive treatment, the patient naive uh, who are coming first and uh, are for daily incontinence of whatever, after ruling out anatomical problems, they have to, vo to fill in the voiding chart and a, and a stool, um, uh, Bristol stool, stool chart. And when they come back, Usually what we see is that they don't drink enough. They have no fluid intake, which is sufficient. They often, they have also constipation and often they, they will have holding maneuvers, underactive, overactive bladder, as I just told you. So what we start in all patients uh, who have problem of incontinence is uh, with what we call the voiding class. And this is for the first line. And in this, this, this class, this is our hero. This is uh, the, the hero of the P. It will help the child by showing, okay, you can do it to go from the nappy to the dry face. And we really take time to show the child that he can do it. And that's really important. That's the educational part. So what we do in Ghent, we have three levels of education. We just first have, as I just told you, and I will show you further, the voiding class. That's for all patients with whatever incontinence problem who are just coming for the first time in our consultation. If it's not working enough, we have the voiding school where they come um, during a week uh, every day in the hospital uh, in small groups. 
and will have uh, education, especially in those children who might be refractory. And then on a third level, especially in the children who are really refractory, whatever we do to any medication, as even to a lot of medication we've been trying to Botox or whatever, we also have the voiding camps. So during the voiding camps, that's the third level, we take the children during one week during the summer or the school holidays and we organize the camp where we play with them, but they also have to focus on drinking and learn drinking and go regularly to the toilets. That's the voiding camp and I will show you more just in a few seconds. So this is our typical flow chart. Um, it's uh, the classical intake. So it's in Dutch, I know you cannot understand it, but just to show you this, there's really stratified how we start. Um, at each step where you have to look, especially for the Euroflow, for whatever, to be tracking dysfunctional voiding, to be tracking overactive bladder, to be tracking whatever, and then, they all go but what we call the voiding class after four weeks so this is really a, um, the flow chart which is available to anyone who is interested and that helps any child with whatever incontinence it's a standard protocol every child goes through this um, so you see the f that's the first step after four weeks the voiding class the, the child have been having the first consultation at the urologist where they had an ultrasound, they have an anatomical check. And once we know that they have only a voiding problem and they, have, they are back with their voiding uh, calendar, what we do is we show them during a session of an hour the heroes of the peace. And you see here the heroes of the pea that accompany the children during this one hour entertainment and class who will show them what they have to do. Um, those are the different devices we help if, if in Chile here with um, what we call uh, the alarm and you see uh, it's, a, it's a group session and the child well not, not anymore as, uh, it was it used to be six to eight children with each one with a parent. Of course, right now in uh, pandemic time, we have to we have stopped this, and we will start again in a few weeks, but with smaller groups uh, to to be able to have the social distancing. Um, but we still think that this group session, even doing in safety with uh, with the COVIDian, will be really important because the group session. If you teach the urotherapy to a child with another child who sees, okay, I'm not alone, the other people have the same problem, it will be much easier to apply it for the child. And so the teaching of the urotherapy, it's done every week normally, um, and it's done by two people, a physiotherapist, a nurse, and a urologist or a nephrologist. And it's a team of two people who just animate this class and show, during, uh, thanks to those animations, the child what he has to do to, to be able to, to control his bladder. If the child understands with those cartoons, those animations, what they really have to do, they will be much more able to apply it when they are back home. In place, if you just explain it at the outpatient clinic and just give some explanation in 10 minutes, it won't be working. Here, with an hour where you really show them with cartoon, it really remains and you really feel that those children are motivated with it. So that's really the importance of having a team behind that because it's time consuming. I mean, it's a session of an hour, so not everybody can do it every week. So we have really the team trying to, to, to make it possible for everybody on a regular basis to do it. Um, and so what we do basically during this one hour is that we inform the child and the parent and we demystify. So here, typically, that's a cartoon explaining the doors represent the sphincter and you see the bladder there. And we explain the child what he's doing with his hypertone uh, sphincter and how he has to relax it, how he has to, to take control of it. And suddenly, if the child understands that it's a door, so what's important is that it's a child, but with the parent. 
And so we give lifestyle advice and we show them how much they should be drinking. We show them what they really have to do. And uh, after filling the bladder bowel diary, we discuss it with them. Okay, so you, for example, the parents told us, yes, my child is drinking normally. And they come back with a bladder bowel diary where you see that they drink a lot of Coke or whatever, or sparkling water or tea or whatever. And there are a lot of tea. But on the overall, they are drinking less than half a, a liter per, per day. So they have an insufficient fluid intake. And of course, with this insufficient fluid intake, they will have also probably constipation. So if you explain that to the parents and you show them with what they filled in, what's exactly going on, it's motivates the child and also the parents are aware of what's going on. And if you give rewards, it will be really nice for the child. So that's the cartoon. If he, the child pees well with relaxing, give a reward. And you see the pee man here, which is happy because he was able to relax with the right position on the toilet. So that's really important. Also, why do the children have to drink? I mean, we all tell them if you have dysfunctional voiding, if you have overactive bladder or whatever, you have to start your therapy by drinking at least one liter, one liter 0.5 a day. But why do you have to drink? So we explain those children, okay, those are the two kidneys and the water you drink is transformed into pee into your kidneys and it goes into your bladder. So that's why you have to drink a lot, even if your bladder is doing difficult at the, the moment. And so if the children understand what is going on, it works really better in my opinion. And that's what we see also and what we've been reporting. It's really important also to have, we all know that, the right position on the seat, that they are not hanging on, on the, in the toilet. Uh, not many Parents know that, but if you try to explain it in the consultation room, it's much more difficult than if you just show this cartoon. Again, it's education, it's time consuming, but it works. And what do they have to drink and to eat uh, in the evening? Avoid the milk products and things like that, dairy products. Well, it's much easier if they have the cartoon reminding them okay it's evening time i shouldn't be drinking milk i should be aware that i have to do this or that again it's really nice the last thing that we do during this first class is explaining the overflow to those children so uh, we know they have dysfunctional voiding or staccato or whatever um, because they had the first UFO but the first time they did it they didn't always understand what they were doing so what we do basically is we show them okay this is how you pee right now and unbroken um, that's what we want you to have and if they understand what's a space mountain or whatever that they have to do that next time they will see their next euro flow they will see okay it's good or it's not good so if the child is really trying to do his or her best to try to uh, gain that plateau shape that that's bell shaped curved it will work much easier and so we really uh, take the comparison with that nice cartoon and what they see that comes out our silly machine so that they understand what is going on and you really see if you do that with each child that it becomes kind of a game that the child really wants okay now i will truly try to do my best and it's even amusing because if uh, after a few times they still produce that they want to try again and they will say okay next time i will try to do it better they really it's kind of game so that's really important according to our experience and it's important to try to move it, motivate them and so the, the aim is really to try to renormalize this voiding pattern by showing them how to relax and showing them how to have a right position so we will try to uh, normalize those things and the thing is that um, it works on the first line, the voiding class, and it's uh, we are preparing a manuscript that we that, well that should be submitting soon, showing the results of this class. Uh, the class works uh, after six to six weeks to three months in most than 60% of the children on the first line for daily incontinence, which is a lot, and it remains on long-term follow-up. After that, 
if you see that the child is not still okay and is refractory, we will, of course, depending on the pathology, if the, introduce medication to a company or introduce uh, further physiotherapy. Um, for overactive bladder, we will give an anticholinergics and so on and so on. The thing is that if you have um, still in <coughs> sorry, incontinence after a few weeks, we will uh, propose a child to go to the, the voiding school. And so the voiding school applies the same principles, but there it's an, an inpatient clinic during a whole week in the hospital. And they do a few Euroflows during the day to understand what exactly they are doing. And more, they will eventually have um, physiotherapy and TENS and neuromodulation and whatever to show them how to renormalize that. So that will be really important. Uh, the, the voiding school, and it's a, a manuscript which is uh, right now uh, in press in Journal of Pediatric Urology, uh, shows that basically uh, in 70% of those children, you have a normalization of the pattern on the long run. Uh, so for the rest of the life of the child, um, while if you compare with anticholinergics or whatever you give in the first line, it will relapse after a few weeks. So here, and you can go for the, the um, the online manuscript. I don't have it here. I'm sorry for that. But you can really check on the long run, 70% of those children with the voiding school who are refractory will be okay on the long run. So it gives good results with just basically education, time and motivation and a few cartoons. So I come here, I think, to my uh, conclusions about dysfunctional voiding and daily incontinence. That's Dysfunctional voiding is really a frequent lower urinary tract disorder in children. And um, the first line therapy, which is often left aside because we are not always educated into this functional aspect. We are all educated into surgery, but we are not all ed educated in that functional aspect. And urotherapy, next to not being surgery, is really time consuming. So it's often really left aside um, because you have to, to have the time, you have to have the, the people able to do it. And so it's it's often easier just to do the medication first and to wait. While we've been seeing uh, to the publications uh, from our center and from Denmark that urotherapy is effective in the long term. And that's really interesting because you will educate a child to be dry for the rest of his life just by giving a class, just by re-educating the child into a normal pattern. And it's really child-friendly. I mean, you have no contraindication. You have no problem with that. The only thing is that possibly it won't work. It's, it will be just waste his time. That's the only possible um, and desirable effect. So that's quite easy to do. But it needs to be multidisciplinary because we as surgeons, we don't always have the time to do it. So it's important to have the help of a nurse or somebody wanting to spend some time in that. And that's really important, that multidisciplinary aspect about it. So mm -hmm. I thank you all for uh, being here. And I hope that it has been helping understanding uh, better how to take care of this dysfunctional voiding. And um, I'm ready for any questions and i hope that you've been uh, knowing what you wanted to see thank you <laughs> and uh, and thank you very much for the very uh, comprehensive uh, lecture for voiding dysfunction uh, actually we enjoyed a lot your uh, lecture uh, before we go to professor mohammed youssef uh, from alexandria and the professor salim khalil from uh, zagazik for the questions and discussion with you um, I would like you to elaborate more on the structure of the voiding school. Uh, what you do for the child um, during the five days or during the, the week admitted in the voiding school? What is your regimen? So basically, they come from the Monday to the Friday, usually during school holidays. And there is basically a, a physiotherapist and a few nurses who are just busy with them. Um, what they do is uh, we have on the we have in the pediatric ward uh, playground. So those children have somebody uh, from the scouts or whatever who is there busy playing with them during the day. 
we know we tell those scouts they are educated about that before and we tell them okay you have to take care that they drink that amount according to the age during the whole day and they have each time that they have to pee to go to the Euroflow. And um, there's a, a physician, a, ph a physiotherapist there who shows them uh, basically, okay, you've been peeing well, you've been peeing not well, what you've been doing and gives immediately feedback to what the child has been producing. With that also, we, we immediately see those children eventually with dysfunctional voiding um, or with overactive bladder of whatever. And so there's one of us, pediatric or uh, pediatric urologist or nephrologist who comes at least who comes once a day and um, if necessary for overactive bladder will start anticholinergics uh, if necessary for dysfunctional voiding and if, if it's the urotherapy is not helping enough just by drinking will just have help giving pelvic floor exercises and so that's really at the, time, at the end of each day so basically those children, they are in the hospital, but in a friendly, friendly environment, they just have the support of the nurses, of the physiotherapist, and of the visit of the urologist or the pediatric nephrologist once a day. And so um, usually the first two days are not always easy because they don't do it that well. They, they need to be reminded a lot of times uh, by, by the, the educational guys. Um, but you see usually after three to five days that the, those children are doing really better. You will see, see that those children eventually with um, normal bladder capacity for enuretics that you can with, you can start the alarm eventually during the, 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 the those moments so it's really just taking time for those children and letting them play together it's usually groups of six children yeah uh, thank you Anne. Uh, now uh, professor mohammed youssef and uh, professor salem uh, let us start with uh, professor mohammed youssef the head of pediatric urology in alexandria university he will, um, he, he's having uh, multiple questions from the participants now to ask. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Haysan. So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about my uh, camera. I think it's not working. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, Anne, for this interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, before we pick the questions of the audience, I would like to uh, ask you a couple of mine. So, um, what is the earliest age and did you see a ch child with a voiding dysfunction? Because going with the pathogenesis that you mentioned, you are anticipating children to come to you like three, four, five years of age. So my, my question is, what is the youngest age have you seen a case with a dysfunctional voiding? Um, with dysfunctional voiding, I basically saw a young girl uh, last week, uh, two years and a half, um, who the mother was really pushing during these pandemic times and the mother was at home and she had really forced that young girl into potty training to be able to put her at school back as soon as possible. And so that young girl, two and a half, was having repeatedly since the pandemics, uh, bladder infections. And that's why she was consulting. She didn't know, the mother didn't know that she had dysfunctional voiding. She was potty trained two years and a half. And basically she had the bladder infections based on the dysfunctional voiding. So the reason I asked you this question is that uh, I think I, we have a couple of, uh, children like one and a half years and they were presenting with the typical uh, appearance of dysfunctional voiding and they are still on nabi so um, i was questioning how in these young kids they reach to this uh, phase of dysfunctional voiding even though before they have started putty training well, here I think it's the part of the mat normal maturation, because if you look at a neonate, um, he have reflex micturition, and it's uh, 
Sometimes, sometimes it seems classical also of dysfunctional avoiding, but it will still mature. And if you give the, the, the child time, not everybody will develop dysfunctional avoiding. It's only in those children that you, where you will see that they, they, they are really pushed that they will develop dysfunctional avoiding. I mean, a staccato pattern, if you want to know half and in and the nappy, it's not abnormal. It's still part of the, the, the maturation of the connection between the brain and the bladder I, okay. I, we, we all go through that normal phase yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I have another comment before I leave the question to my to the professor Salem so um, if you have a, a, a young girl like four or five years and she's coming with with a fibroid UTI and she has like three uh, VR uh, vesicle urethra reflux grade three or four and she is having an overt Dysfunction, dysfunctional voiding, and then you started to control the dysfunctional voiding, but your your therapy and medication was not a success. So, how would you proceed in such a situation? The family is seeing that the, their daughter is having a reflux and recurrent infection, and you are concentrating on treating the dysfunctional voiding, and there is no good response. How are you going to deal with the reflux? Well, it depends, I think, on how uh, important is a reflux. Here you mentioned a reflux grade 3, 4, 3, 4. It's already something quite important just to be based only on dysfunctional voiding. In my opinion, you can develop low-grade reflux on dysfunctional voiding. If you develop high-grade reflux, it won't be on dysfunctional voiding only. There will be another problem of basically reflux. So I will treat the reflux if it's a high grade next to the dysfunctional voiding. If it's low grade, I will wait a little bit that dysfunctional voiding goes better because I will tell the parents that probably this low grade reflux will be solved by itself by just solving the dysfunctional voiding. Perfect. So Dr. Salim, uh, do you have Thank comments you, before uh, you? And okay. Very nice and uh, demonstrate lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you speak about the uh, training uh, of the toilet training, uh, and uh, it's well known that the early training is problematic, and late training also is problematic. Which of which are more hazardous or more related to dysfunctional voiding, and what is the ideal time of training? Well, I think the ideal time of training is really dependent on each child. You, I mean, you will have young girls who are two, two and a half, three, who are really asking to the parents because they have older siblings or they see the parents who want to be potty training. If the child is mature enough uh, to understand what is going on and is able to, to wait two hours to go to the toilet, I think the child is old enough to, to be started into potty training. On the other hand, you have another child who has absolutely no interest in potty training and who goes to the toilet frequently in the, the nappy and the nappy is wet every 35 minutes or every hour. The child is not ready and you will just force the child into dysfunctional avoiding if you try to potty train him anyway. So I think you cannot say there's an age limit that should be three or four or whatever. It really depends on how ready the child is and giving the parents the limit that the child has to be interested and has to be able to hold two hours without voiding in the nappy. That's a good reference. If you do it before, you will have bad results, in my opinion. Yes, uh, Sarah, I have, I have a, a small com comment before you proceed. Can I ask her something? Of course. So you didn't mention anything about Botox and no, because it's not first line uh, treatment. I mean, um, we will go first with your therapy and then with oral medication, and only in those refractory children with clearly overactive bladder that we will go for Botox. Um, but as for inject injecting Botox, you have to, uh, you require an anesthesia. It won't be our first line treatment. That's why I didn't focus on that. I mean, it's, it's otherwise I would have to talk about so many things. It was not possible to do it tonight. Okay. Uh, and uh, how, how you distribute the fluid intake uh, for the day for the child? How you order your fluid intake? 
So um, we have a chart which is really easy, uh, where they have to start the day on breakfast with uh, a cup of milk of whatever. It's on about 200 milliliters. And then they have at each meal uh, to drink two glasses, two glasses of water or whatever. That's also something that like two, two, 200 milliliters. And next to that, they have to have a bottle of half a liter. And that bottle of half a liter, uh, they should fill it two times, one for the morning, one for the afternoon. And then it should be uh, finished by four o'clock, the time that they go home. Um, because otherwise, if you let them drink that much after four or four in the afternoon, they might have a risk to develop any disease. So basically, yeah. the major part of their fluid intake happens before four o'clock. Thank you. Yes, Professor, Professor Ryan, uh, it's well known that the avoiding uh, dysfunction has a very wide spectrum of uh, presentation and many different terminology and so on. But I want uh, to, uh, you to explain to us uh, which type, why this child go into overactive bladder, another one go, go into DECD, and uh, one of them go into underactive bladder. And discussing the active under, underactive bladder, uh, many question about underactive bladder when you finish the first question? Well, that's a really good question because uh, that's a question I cannot answer. Why those children do have an overactive bladder or an underactive bladder? I mean, as far as I know, nobody really knows why they develop that. Um, the, the, the dysfunctional voiding is a result of that. By why do they have basically a bladder which is overactive? There has been a lot of research about that, especially the team from Denmark, from ARUS, has done uh, bladder biopsies in those overactive bladders to search for genetics, uh, has done bladder biopsy to search for uh, inflammation or whatever. And still, we don't know right now why those children have an overactive bladder or an underactive bladder. So at that point, that's a point where we will st still be looking in the future. Um, what we know well, why they develop is the only thing is the bladder bowel dysfunction. We know that there is constipation there and the constipation is the cause of all the rest. That's the only cause which, which is obvious uh, as far as I know. So there is any triggering event that occur that maybe the trigger of the start of dysfunctional voiding, is there any triggering uh, events uh, to start this uh, functional voiding to avoid later on? Um, I think the, mo the, the biggest trigger is an environment that it's not okay for the child. For example, uh, a child with an underactive bladder, it's typically a child which is at school and has really dirty uh, restrooms. The child will try to not go to the toilet, will wait as long as possible, and to be able to, to wait as long as possible won't drink, and they develop really an underactive bladder as a result of that. Um, how is it possible to develop that on, the long, on, on such, such a short notice after being dry? We don't really know. Um, but that's one thing which is certain. The overactive bladder, why those children develop that, we don't know. That's the same question in adults. Why do some adults develop overactive bladder? We don't know. There is a lot of uh, research right now uh, between the, the link uh, between the brain and the bladder because we've been seeing that a lot of children develop overactive bladder as a trigger by stress, starting school, uh, parents' divorce, or whatever. And we've been knowing that um, stress can be expressed by headaches, by overactive bladder, by by, uh, stomach, by uh, tummy ache or whatever. And we think there might be a trigger there in the brain, but we still don't really know. So well, uh, and, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and please, uh, there is a question from a uh, participant to Dr. Salem to, to complete your question. Yes. Uh, what is the treatment of um, a case of underactive uh, bladder with high residual uh, urine and resistant to two time voiding and double voiding and all the conservative measures. How, how you proceed with this chart? 
Well, first of all, I think you have to, to make sure there is no constipation in the background because if they really have an underactive bladder and constipation, usually they will try to avoid. Those children, if you try to really normalize their fluid intake, usually it will, it will go better from itself after some time. Uh, I mean, the problem in my experience of uh, void, timed voiding is that the parents, after a few days, they do it. And after a few days, if you don't see rapid improvement, they will stop with it. The yeah. problem is if, that if you don't tell the parents and the child it will take weeks, but it will be okay, they will stop because they think it doesn't work. And so again, I think here, um, explanation uh, of what's going on and why it takes time it's really important if you tell the children your bladder is a muscle and it's just like football or whatever sports that you like you have to train to 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 be able to control it and you cannot train you cannot be really good after two days you have to train for weeks to be to be good that's a concept they understand so in my opinion, you will be able to solve more than 90, 95% of those cases uh, just by education and just focusing on that. The remaining 10% are those children where probably there's a disorder we don't understand, which is correlated to that, and that those are the children who will end up probably having to catheterize. Yeah. In my opinion. Uh, uh, Professor Ann, it's well known that there is no medication that increased uh, bladder contractility or no medication that relax sphincter and no medication even that can increase the sensation. Mm -hmm. So what is the uh, treatment? Is uh, alpha blocker has substantial role in treatment of uh, dysfunction voiding? Yes. Well, the thing is, as you say, there is nothing which is, has been proven to work. Uh, you actually, yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, and as you say, you might try alpha blockers. Uh, we do it in some cases. Um, I'm not a big fan of that because I haven't seen really much success, uh, honestly. So uh, we do it when we have the impression that there is nothing else. Um, one thing that I've been seeing, which in my opinion is working well, is a neurostimulation, the TENS. Um, I mean, we don't know how it works, but in those interactive bladder, if you use a low frequency TENS, uh, 20 hertz, um, or uh, tibial nerve stimulation uh, daily during one hour on low frequency, you see improvement. Uh, how it really works, I don't know, but it works. And so that will be my first line treatment before I would go to alpha blockers, which in my opinion are not so good. Thank you. Dr. Aysen. Uh Dr. Mohamed Youssef, do you have any question? Dr. Youssef? Uh, Dr. Salim, allow, allow me to, uh, uh, to have Dr. Ehab Rafat with us. Okay. He has uh, he have several questions to ask. So yes, please, uh, yeah. So please, Dr. Ehab Rafat, I'm um, unmuting you now, please. Hi, Anne. Hello. Hello. It's Good nice evening. to meet you. It's a very nice presentation. Thanks. Many thanks Thank for you. you. We have many questions about nocturnal enuresis. Uh, are the urotherapy is uh, improve the results only without any medication in the cases of nocturnal enuresis? Yes, and that's impressive. That's why I really like it, because you have those. Boys, uh, typically, um, who co come on the first time at the consultation at your place, they fill in the bladder diary and they come back for the, that urotherapy session and you see that they have a normal bladder capacity, uh, uh, sorry, a small bladder capacity. You just explain them urotherapy and you explain them that they have to increase their bladder capacity from, let's say, 150 to 250. And they can do that really fast. Uh, within six weeks, you can see the bladder capacity improving or doubling. And after six weeks, they come back at your consultation and 50% of them are dry. And that's why I really find it so, so nice because just by increasing the bladder capacity in those children with the, the no overactive bladder, just a limited bladder capacity, it will be solved just by inc increasing this capacity. So what are the instructions can we uh, say to the, uh, those patients of cryptoenoresis? So basically, um, if you look at the, 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 the voiding chart and you see 
the boy who is drinking something like half a liter per day and uh, who has a bladder capacity of 150, I tell them to drink uh, half a, uh, one liter and a half a day and I ask them to uh, do super peas. So what is a super pee? Uh, that's an exercise that they have to do three times a week. I ask for three times a week in the hope that I will have two, <laughs> to be honest. And so what they have to do is that they have to choose moments in the week when they have time. And then on this, that special moment, they have to drink quite a lot on a short time. And then when they have the feeling they have to pee, they have to try to postpone it as long as possible to produce what we call really the super pee. So the, the super pee, the, what will it, will it do? It will show you, first of all, the maximum bladder capacity, but it will also show them, okay, this is where I have my bladder full and it will show the link with the brain and it will help them also wake up at night after a, a little bit training when they have this bladder capacity. So they, it makes them aware of the sensation of full bladder. And so uh, if you tell them to do that, and if you give it, if you give the boys the, 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 the trick to do a little bit competition, what's perfect is a seven years old who has, or eight years old, who has an older brother, and you tell him you're doing competition with your brother to try to make a bigger pee than him, I can assure you that boy will be dry. If he drinks a lot and does super pee, he will be dry after two months. You have to trigger that competition and the, the, to ex if they understand why they have to do the competition with a bladder, they will be dry. It works perfectly. Okay. I, I have more questions. Hi, Sam, I can ask if I have yeah. time. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, and I want to ask about the bladder wall sickness. Is, yeah. Is, is, is if any, allowed. Uh, yes, if and allowed, yeah. <laughs> is there uh, any rule in the bladder wall sickness and treatment of overactive bladder? That I mean that if the bladder wall sickness is the... Uh, much more uh, high. I can shift directly uh, to medication rather than urotherapy. Uh, personally, what I would do is I would start with urotherapy during one month, and then they will have difficulties producing super peas. I just as I just told you. So at that moment, I will introduce anticholinergics to help them uh, with this overactive bladder. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, hi, Hassan. Okay, uh, Yusuf, man. Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. And another question. It's me, Yusuf. No. So, well, I'm asking about the anticholinergics, anticholinergics use, and it, it's uh, uh, what is your preference? And <laughs> when, whenever you indicate anticholinergics, we know that it can increase the odds of having constipation. So, do you have any tip for that? Uh, well, and if you Oh, sorry. Yeah. If you, oh, sorry about that. If you, if you get the help of a pediatric gastroenterologist for the constipation, or we just deal, it, deal with this, tell, tell us your, your, your experience. So basically, uh, when I do the ultrasound, I look, at, as you said, as the bladder sickness, but I also look at the rectal diameter. So I can be sure if I really see um, the, that the rectum is distended more than three, milli, three centimeter, I know that they have constipation. Um, so for that, at that moment, what I do, I won't immediately ask for the help of a gastroenterologist. I will uh, start by myself lactulose or um, uh, other agents that will soften the stools. Um, regarding anticholinergics, I fully agree that they are known to increase the constipation. That's especially true for the oxybutynin. That's the one causing the most of the constipation. So basically what i do is i tell the the parents okay we we have here different options we have the oxybutynin which is a good medication but might increase the problem or might cause problem of constipation or we have other anticholinergics uh, like solifenacine tolterodine and others um, some of them are off label um, solifenacine is now recognized for children from two years old, uh, but not in OAB, I agree, only in neurogenic, but it's still it's possible. Um, I will tell them also, the parents, that uh, the advantage of solifenacine, tolterodine, and others is that it will cause 
less constipation and will have other less side effects and also that it only has to be taken uh, once a day compared to the oxybutylin which has to, to be taken uh, three times a day. So for all those children being at school, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to give it three times a day and so many parents will choose for solifilacine, telteridin or whatever second class uh, anticholinergics. Uh, Yusuf, can I ask a question, please, Yusuf? Uh, Anne, uh, do you hear me, Anne? Yes. Um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Walid Dawood, is a professor of pediatric urology in Alexandria, is asking you two questions. What about the treatment of the voiding dysfunction in children with attention deficit uh, disorders and with uh, autistic um, uh, traits? Uh, how you proceed in those uh, children? And also he's asking about a refractory recurrent urinary tract infection during the management of overactive bladder, how you behave. Um, first of all, for ADHD um, or attention disorders and those autistic children, that's a good question, really a good question because it's difficult. Uh, first of all, those children with um, important attention disorders, you will see that once they start eventually, if they need it, medication for their attention disorder struggle, that the, the incontinence will be better also. That's really impressive, but that's one thing that we see. Now you have a lot of children with attention disorder which, has, which are borderline and don't really need medication for that. Um, the problem there is that if you give them oxybutynin, you might uh, be at risk to increase those attention disorders um, yeah. with the anticholinergic effects. So in those children with attention disorder, I will try to avoid especially oxybutynin, which is the one which has the most side effects about that, and I will go so in my preference for the solifenacine, which is in my experience, has less side effects on the cognition part. That's the first thing for attention yeah. disorders. Now for the autistic children, um, that's something which is really interesting also because we also have a large population of those children. Um, in our experience, we've seen that in those children, education will work also, but it's even more demanding. So we have special groups of children with autism or whatever, and they come even more often uh, to the, those education program and revalidation program. And you will see, okay, in a normal child with no problem, it will take so many months to be dry. In um, autistic child, it will take usually two or three times that long, but it will work also at the end. In most children, not in, in everyone, depends on how deep, of course, the autistic traits are present. Um, and the last question was uh, uh, recurrent urinary tract. Oh yes, sorry, sorry. With overactive blood. <laughs> no sorry, problem. excuse me. Um, no, no problem. <laughs> typically, um, those children with uh, voiding dysfunction, urinary tract infection, what I will do is I will start classically urotherapy and physiotherapy, but I will give them antiprophylaxis during the time that they have the re this reeducation program, just to make sure that, uh, first of all, they have no further infection and then to to have the parents with me so that they understand okay we're we're giving medication for the time that the problem is being solved and it's important in my opinion that they understand it's no medication forever it's just temporarily while we can be solving the problem that's how i do it i don't know what's your experience yeah uh, and uh, we are doing the same and but what is your threshold in those children with overactive bladder and recurrent uti to do uh, voiding cystoerythrogram or to do invasive urodynamic study. What, what, what are the indications in your practice? Well, first of all, we are um, at my university, we are a referral center. Um, so like in most universities, so we see a lot of children like you probably do who have been treated by the pediatricians and by the urologist uh, in the city or whatever for a long time. Um, my criterion uh, in Ghent is if the child has been treating unsuccessful by 
medication of whatever more than six months, I will do immediately a functional uh, urodynamic to make sure that we are not missing anything important. Um, now, in a child who comes for the first time at my place and has had no treatment and is having urinary tract infection for three months or whatever, um, I will just go first on urotherapy and prophylaxis and see how it goes during two months. Um, and if I see improvement on the dysfunctional voiding of whatever, um, and if I see that the child um, is improving in any way, I will wait. Uh, I won't do your dynamics immediately. I will wait something like six months. Uh, if it fails, well, if, if I, when I stop the prophylaxis, that it comes back again before I will do your dynamics because it's still quite invasive. Uh, so I prefer to go quite slower. Yeah, uh, Dr. Youssef, uh, Dr. Salem. Yes, uh, Professor Ian, going, going back uh, to terminology, some uh, of our uh, professors uh, ask about is the lazy bladder syndrome is the same like that of the underactive bladder or they are, yeah. have different terminology? Um, the lazy bladder syndrome is the, the, the ter terminology which is recognized in adults. Uh, while the underactive bladder syndrome, it's uh, according to the official term according to ICCS terminology. Basically, we think it's just the same concept that eventual, eventually uh, evolves into adulthood. But I mean, it's different groups who define both. That's why you have different words. Yes, in case of refractory dysfunctional voiding associated with reflux and recurrent uh, UTI, uh, sometimes febrile. Can we inject uh, a bulking agent in the liver ureter if the uh, rehabilitation of the bladder is not achieved completely or a relapse occurring and so on? Well, is there a role for the bulking agent in the liver ureter to protect the upper tract from febrile infection at least? You can discuss here. I think it's really debatable, but in my opinion, if the problem is the bladder, um, you should treat the bladder and not the, the not the, the ureter. So the bulking ager, it will just make a door to avoid that the urine goes back to the kidneys. But if the bladder is full, I mean, on the long run, the deflux won't hold. So if the problem is that the child has continuously a bladder which is uh, almost full because it has a lady bladder and he has to strain and to push and to, to force urine out, I mean, the deflux will be gone after, in my opinion, after a few months. So I think you probably can do it, but I'm not sure you will solve the problem on the long run and it might come back after a few years if the child is still straining and pushing to, to void, if the bladder is still underactive, if you don't treat the bladder. Uh, Dr. Salem, uh, please. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Mohammed El Ghanemi from uh, Cairo University. Dr. Mohammed El Ghanemi, he wants to ask Anne uh, several questions, please. Mohammed. Uh, hi, this is Haitham. Hi, Professor Ann. Hello. Uh, meet you. Uh, we hear you, Mohammed. Uh, well, I, I, I wanted to ask about uh, the, we all have an awareness about the proper time to start uh, toilet training for uh, kids, uh, for daytime toilet training. But we have no idea about the uh, standard protocol or the proper protocol to start nocturnal training or nocturnal dryness. Uh, do you have any stand standardized form or age where you would start nocturnal training? And what would be the standardized protocols that you would use for nocturnal childhood training? Because I believe uh, that uh, this is one of the main uh, uh, problems that face, face parents and uh, forces them uh, in trying to reinforce dryness on the children, especially uh, if they want to achieve nighttime continence, which is more difficult than day, day mm -hmm. 
Well, I think regarding definition, uh, nighttime incontinence or enuresis is, by, is considered by the ICCS, by the International Children's Continence Society, uh, as normal up until the age of uh, six. So it's only starting at seven that it's not normal anymore to have uh, enuresis, to have uh, nocturnal problems. So basically, um, you don't have to start too early. Um, and the protocol is just a continuation of what we have during the day. So you have to work on what's the problem. I mean, if the problem uh, is the bladder capacity, uh, based on the rewarding chart, we will work on that starting at seven by during the, the, the urotherapy. Is the problem, if it is the overactive bladder, we will work on that with the, over, with the urotherapy also. Um, so basically, especially uh, in those, we will apply exactly the same treatment as those children with daily incontinence. Um, as long, it's exactly the same problem, it's just further maturation. So the, we don't have a different protocol for daytime incontinence or for nighttime incontinence. It just goes faster when it's only nighttime incontinence because it means probably that they have a better bladder control uh, because they are already able to, to hold a little bit during the day, uh, while if it's a uh, daily incontinence, they sometimes have absolutely no control. So it's just a continuation of the same protocol to answer your question. Uh, do you have any standardized uh, protocol for the fluid intake overnight? Because I see that you have clearly clarified the amount of the fluid intake during the day, mm -hmm. stating that uh, uh, you should start to fix fluid around 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. That is meaning uh, Three hours before bed, bedtime, I believe. That is two hours before the bedtime, yes. Two hours before the bedtime. Okay, yes, two hours before you bedtime. Can, you can sleep quite early, just one thing I can say. Because well, I, <laughs> of course it depends, oh sorry, of course it depends on, on your day. Schedule. I mean, uh, in Belgium, children start school at eight o'clock and finish school at four o'clock, and we eat uh, around uh, six, seven o'clock in the uh, in the evening. So, uh, and usually by eight they are in their bed. So the standard protocol is by four when the school is finished. They have to to have drunk something like one point two liters. Um, starting at four, they have to avoid all dairy products, so no yogurt, no milk, no no cheese, uh, because all those dairy products increase the the, um, the nocturnal uh, urine production because it's high load of proteins. So they have to avoid that starting at four. Starting at four, they have to avoid also uh, every carbonated um, fluids, so coke, sparkling water, whatever with bubbles. They have to avoid that because it will stimulate the bladder. They have to avoid coffee and tea, uh, iced tea and those things because caffeine or tea will stimulate the bladder also. They have to avoid chocolate because in chocolate there is theophylin. It works just the same as caffeine. Um, that's a standard protocol. Also, they have to drink one last meal, uh, one last glass, uh, well, one or two glasses uh, during uh, the meal uh, the, in the evening. And really important, uh, after the meal in the evening, they are not allowed to drink anymore. Um, they, they especially cannot drink, uh, take drinks in their bed or in their room, because a lot of children, basically what they do is at school, they don't drink at all, and they start drinking at home and during the, the evening. So um, if they do that, of course, they will pee in their bed. While if you just try to normalize, it will be much easier. So this is our standard protocol regarding enuritics. Uh, and uh, we have our last question from uh, Dr. Asim Roslan uh, from Alexandria too. He is going to ask you his question, Dr. Asim. Awesome. We we hear you, awesome. Uh, it's okay. We lost awesome. And uh, okay, um, the last question. And what about the giggle incontinence? And uh, the treatment for the giggle incontinence. 
That's a good question. Uh, that's the only uh, giggle incontinence where uh, the tr standard treatment won't be working. Anticholinergic urotherapy uh, won't be working, and it's typically the the girl uh, with uh, urine with um, giggle incontinence won't be able to hold back. And there, in my experience, uh, the only medication which works, uh, and I think it's been published also, but I don't know the reference about that. It's the the Danish uh, team, I think. They published that uh, relatine um, is working on that, and that's the, the the only medication that works on typically giggle incontinence. And you can stop it. You can stop it after three months in their experience. Yeah, thank you, Doctor Salem. Last question, please. Doctor Mohammed, Doctor Doctor Mohammed. Yes, I I wanted to ask about one pathology which which I've seen. A couple of times, and I know that you have, must have seen a lot about the extraordinary daytime frequency, because I've seen this pathology a couple of times in children, and it comes and goes on its own with no real uh, background. Because I've tried to analyze these children several times, searching for a dysfunctional voiding, I couldn't find any form of dysfunctional voiding, and yet uh, I've read a lot about it, and all I could see is that it's a sort of a pathology where you can have to comfort the parents that it's going to go away on its own. So do you have any uh, experience with extraordinary daytime frequency in children? Do I have an experience with, I didn't understand, I'm sorry. Extraordinary daytime frequency. Um, usually it's the, the only experience I had was uh, children with a lot of psychological problems um, that were really improved with um, consultation with a psychologist. I, I remember a young boy, uh, four years old, who was l literally peeing every four minutes, uh, four to five minutes, uh, small amounts, but still. Um, and after ruling out that he has, a, of course, a brain tumor or whatever producing um, uh, hyperhydration, um, the only thing we could find is that he was probably in a lot of stress by starting school. And we, we addressed him to a psychologist and it went really well because after something like uh, four or five sessions, and I don't know exactly what the psychologist did, but it's, it, it improved really well. And the child was after five sessions, if I remember well, able to, to wait for an hour to go peeing. And after a few more sessions, he was able to have a normal voiding pattern. So, uh, in my experience, when you cannot explain it by any other means, I refer them to a psychologist after ruling out, of course, anatomical problems. Thank you. Dr. Salem? Yes. Uh, finally, if we have a refractory nocturnal nocturnal neurist, because nocturnal neurist is one of the spectrum dysfunction voiding resistant cases, is there any basic research can uh, detect the real cause of persistence or resistance like the uh, detection of the circadian rhythm, central circadian rhythm or renal circadian rhythm and so on. Is there basic research for, uh, in your institute who can explain this uh, persistent nocturnal neurism? Um, there is research about sleep disorders uh, related to the, this uh, refractory uh, this vo dysfunctional voiding. So uh, we have against the, the, the sleep unit and we've been doing in the, all those children uh, who come in with sleep disorders or whatever for neural problems. We've been study doing studies and we've seen that um, some children with other problems have uh, restless leg syndromes. Um, and those children with restless leg, leg syndrome don't sleep well, don't sleep deep, don't have really a good sleep, and they are also in retics. So there is an association there between indeed in resis and restless leg syndromes and ADHD. But what exactly? Um, I should ask my psychiatrist to tell you more about that because it's her domain of uh, knowledge. I know that we know we work on that, but it's it's ongoing and it's really difficult also to investigate it because of the, the parents are sometimes really reluctant to to have the child spending a night in the hospital with EEG and uh, registration of the, uh, the the voidings. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Salem. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, you. We were very tiring to you with questions. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm afraid of the scissors in your hand. <laughs> you are going to cut, to, the, <laughs> to cut the internet now to stop all these uh, questions. Uh, uh, we enjoyed a lot your presence with us, Anne, and uh, the presentation, the lovely presentation, and lo lovely, humble answers of the old questions, uh, highly scientific uh, answers for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. your time. And I hope uh, one day you will be lecturing us uh, too for uh, the robotic uh, reconstructive surgery in children. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure. I know it's been a really a pleasure to be with you all tonight and I really appreciate that there are so many, many people asking so many questions and being there. Really, I yeah. appreciate it and it's a pleasure. So, yes, I will, we will stay connected. <laughs> yeah, thank you and very much and please uh, stay safe. You and, too. Uh, yeah, and for uh, uh, a very nearby meeting uh, soon. And yes, bye thank bye. you very much. Bye-bye. And you. bye thank to you. everybody. Thank you, Heidi. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.